Good morning. I'm Chris Fox. I'm one of the cerebrovascular and endovascular neurosurgeons here at the Mayo Clinic in Florida. And we're here with you today uh, to discuss cavernous malformations. I'm very pleased to have one of my colleagues from stroke neurology, Dr. Lindsay Williams, with me as well. Hi, I'm Lindsay Williams. As he said, I'm one of the uh, cerebrovascular neurologists at Mayo Clinic Jacksonville, and I'm really happy to join this conversation. Great. Well, so what Dr. Williams and I do is uh, basically we deal with patients who have uh, problems related to the cerebrovascular system, the blood vessels in the brain, and also the spinal cord. And as you would imagine, many of those problems are extremely complicated and complex. And um, we're lucky to work at a place like Mayo Clinic where there are many people from different disciplines, in this case, neurology and neurosurgery, working together with many colleagues in a multidisciplinary way to help us sort out uh, for our patients these complex and complicated disorders. And one of those things that we see on a pretty regular basis is cavernous malformation. So Dr. Williams, what is a cavernous malformation? I'm glad you asked. So cavernous malformations are very thin walled clusters of blood vessels that we can find in the brain or the spinal cord. They're fairly uncommon. So seen in less than 0.2% of the population. And um, they are sometimes something that we find incidentally when we're doing imaging. So we'll look at imaging for a person for another reason and find these. Uh, sometimes they come to us because they've had symptoms of bleeding uh, or seizures that are associated with them. Great. And for patients who have symptoms, what is the most common symptom that they'll have? So one of the more common symptoms that patients have are sometimes stroke-like symptoms that can come with the bleeding. Um, these can be relatively minor or rarely more severe. Uh, seizures are often uh, can come with these, but honestly, the thing that I see most commonly is that they might actually be what we consider clinically silent, meaning that they haven't had any symptoms at all, but we've identified them on the scan for different reasons. For instance, someone might have gotten hit in the head and had an accident and gotten imaging, and then this is found. That's a very good point because as imaging has become more and more um, complex and providing us much clearer pictures than we had even five or 10 years ago, we often see things that um, are completely accidentally found. And then that, um, you know, puts the patient in this situation of not knowing exactly uh, what to do. So um, that's why we're here to help sort that out. And I also uh, wanted to touch on another point you mentioned about bleeding because, um, you know, of course, thinking about bleeding in the brain, it sounds very serious and it is, but for cavernous malformations compared to other vascular lesions we see in the brain, like arteriovenous malformations or aneurysms, when cavernomas bleed, they tend to bleed within themselves in that small area where the lesion is sitting. So these bleeds tend to be much less severe for most patients. Is that correct? That is correct. That's a really good point. So these tend to be smaller. Uh, they tend to be a little bit of a, a lower flow type of bleeding. So a lot of times the symptoms can be a bit more mild, um, which sometimes can make it a little bit harder to identify the cause of the symptoms initially. But it is a good thing to keep in mind that these are a little bit different than other vascular abnormalities you might hear about. They're also different because they're what's called an angiographically occult lesion. So many times you, you may hear um, other patients who have had a cavernous malformation or an aneurysm or an AVM in the brain talk about having a brain catheterization or an angiogram. But for these lesions, for cavernous malformations, because the vasculature involved in them is not the normal artery connecting to a vein like we see in the brain, or for other problems in the brain, an angiogram will not show these lesions. So typically the best way we can look at them is with either a CT scan or an MRI. That's true. A lot of times we do follow these, particularly MRIs can provide us a lot of the detail we need to see. And as you pointed out, a lot of times more invasive imaging isn't necessary. 
Good. And I've also seen many patients who have more than one cavernous malformation. So sometimes when these are discovered, there's more than one lesion there. And that, that can occur in about 50% of patients. I also get lots of questions about, um, you know, is this hereditary? Um, do my children need to be screened or my siblings, my parents, those sorts of questions. And there are hereditary forms of cavernous malformation. They tend to occur more often in patients of Hispanic descent, although that is not always the case. Um, and for patients who do have familial cavernous malformations, they tend to be multiple, but that's the minority of patients. And that's, um, you know, been the case in my practice. I think most patients who have a cavernous malformation, it's a sporadic thing that we don't totally understand why it happens, but it's not something that will be passed on to other family members. That's right. So what we see is about 80% of cavernous malformations are sporadic, like you pointed out, meaning just randomly form. Um, so there's no genetic component at all. As you pointed out, there's no risk for transmitting it to children. About 20% of the cases we see do um, have a inherited condition that causes that. And those are oftentimes patients we might see with multiple, multiple cavernous malformations. It's tricky sometimes picking out some of the genetic ones because sometimes they have what we call variable penetrance of the gene, meaning that some family members might have a more severe form and other family members might have a very mild form. So it is one of those things that's really helpful for us in this institution as we have a lot of res uh, resources regarding geneticists and testing that help us sort this out when it's appropriate. There's also a small percentage of patients that might have these in response to a prior radiation treatment, but those tend to be much less common. So for example, someone who had cancer as a child or another type of cancer and had radiation and then they could develop a cavernous malformation. Mm -hmm. That's right, that can happen as well. So it, it tends to be heavier doses of radiation, so not something that the typical population would have been exposed to. And it's interesting that you bring up the kind of variability of these lesions and that not all cavernous malformations are the same. And certainly from a neurosurgical perspective, that's what we see. Many patients who are referred to us with cavernous malformations have a very small lesion that does not require any kind of active neurosurgical intervention, meaning we don't need to take it out it's a low risk lesion. The risk of the cavernous malformation bleeding on a yearly basis may be as low as a half a percent or 1%. And for a small cavernoma that's in a part of the brain that is not particularly at high risk, oftentimes taking something like that out with surgery would be higher risk than just leaving it alone, which is very reassuring to most patients. On the other hand, there are some cavernous malformations that tend to be higher risk and they are at a higher risk of bleeding and causing problems. And from our perspective, if those are in locations that we can remove safely with surgery, we often do so um, to mitigate the risk of having a bleeding problem that could cause neurologic problems in the future. That's very true. Um, one of the things I do is monitor people over time with cavernous malformations, as you pointed out, Many of these have such a low risk that the risk of surgery isn't worthwhile. And so many of these, we just watch and follow over time. We do that by repeat checks um, in person or by video where we check and make sure there's no new symptoms. Uh, periodically, we may need to get follow-up scan depending on the specific situation for that person. But as these are uncommon conditions that aren't seen as commonly in the general public, I think it's very useful to be at a place like this where you can see someone that's seen many patients along that line and where you and I can talk to each other as a physician and surgeon to come up with the best treatment plan for each patient. So it's a very catered and tailored thing for each individual situation. So no single cavernoma is like another one. So a very individual approach. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, that's why we have a multidisciplinary cavernous malformation clinic involving neurologists, neurosurgeons, neuroradiologists, everyone who deals with patients who have these problems comes together 
we have multiple minds thinking about it instead of uh, one person trying to manage everything. And, you know, even within neurosurgery, there may be multiple neurosurgeons who have different areas of expertise coming together to treat patients with cavernous malformations. For example, someone such as myself who does cerebrovascular neurosurgery, but at times we even do awake surgery to remove cavernous malformations and then get our colleagues involved to often do that for tumor type surgery. So there's a multidisciplinary approach. The same thing from a neurology perspective, uh, because patients with cavernous malformations often present with seizures. Um, Dr. Williams may want to ask one of her colleagues who is a specialist in seizure management to assist with that. So that's what the, the whole goal of having a team coming together to treat these complex um, type uh, problems really is a benefit for patients. Absolutely. So we often get our epileptologists or seizure doctors, as you pointed out, involved when we need that help. And they can be a great resource for us. As we talked about before, we have geneticists that can help if there's a concern for it being in a genetic condition. So we have a whole group of people that can help out and get to the, the ultimate best treatment plan for each patient. Great. Speaking of patients who present with seizures, what's your, your typical management um, if, a, if a patient has a cavernous malformation and has a seizure from that? What, what do you like to recommend first? So... We often do try an anti-seizure medication. Uh, we often very early on though, get our epileptologists and our neurosurgeons as well to look at the case. Sometimes there are certain situations where we may decide that removing the cavernoma to reduce the risk of ongoing seizures is appropriate. There are a lot of factors that go into that decision. Uh, obviously, uh, risk of surgery, our thoughts of long-term success of using medication therapy, but it's a, a very multidisciplinary approach when seizures are involved to determine the best uh, course of action for each patient. Those are great points. And patients often ask me as well, well, if I have surgery to remove the cavernoma, what are the chances are, you know, what are the chances of my seizures going away? And it depends a little bit on what the cavernous malformation looks like and where it is and how big it is and which part of the brain is affected. But in general, Probably three out of every four patients who have surgery to remove a cavernous malformation because of a seizure will be seizure-free in the future, either sometimes on seizure medication, hopefully off seizure medication. So it's not a guarantee that the cavernous malformation uh, resection or removal of surgery will get rid of the seizures, but there is a very high chance of that. So as Dr. Williams mentioned, these are one of the types of discussions that we often have to figure out the best course of action for our patients. That's right. So it, it's a wonderful team we have here. I think it's something that uh, patients with cavernous malformations get uh, quite a bit of benefit from seeing multiple different people and all putting our thoughts together to come up with a best tailored plan. Absolutely. So if we can help you in any way, uh, please um, go to our website, have your physician refer you to our clinic, uh, call the Department of Neurology or Neurosurgery, and our team will uh, work to make things easy and uh, get you here for our opinion. We also do many uh, visits virtually, so uh, being geographically close to the Mayo Clinic is no longer a requirement, and we're happy to uh, help in any way we can. Absolutely. So look forward to meeting you out there if that's something that you're seeking care for. All right. Thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.